got me going through my rebirth. Speaking of rebirth, let's talk about Tom King's run on Batman Rebirth. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Today, I want to talk with you about a relatively new writer. He's had a lot of success, and with success can come criticism. Some of that criticism I actually agree with. I want to talk with you about Tom King. He's a writer at DC Comics who recently wrapped up an 85-issue run on Batman. Now, he uses a lot of the unique language of comics to tell stories in some clever ways. But does the sum of all the parts add up to something greater than the whole? Well, that's what we're going to take a look at today. So first, let's take a quick look at Tom King's history, and then we'll take a look at the run that he's had on Batman to analyze some of his techniques, or as I might call them, personal tropes. Let's get into it. Tom King graduated from Columbia University in 2000 and interned at both Marvel and DC Comics while in college. But after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, King altered his career path and joined the CIA, where he became a counterterrorism operations officer. About seven years later, King's first child was born and he decided to pursue his original dream. His debut novel, A Once Crowded Sky, was published in 2012. It was a superhero story and got him the attention of DC Comics. He began writing for Grayson about Batman's protege Nightwing in 2014 and wrote Omega Men beginning in 2015. That year also saw his Vertigo crime book Sheriff of Baghdad begin. The book was his first of many collaborations with artist Mitch Gerards and was based on many of his experiences from his time in the CIA in Iraq. That year also saw him begin a 12-issue series for Marvel called Vision. That followed Vision and his newly created android family trying to live a normal suburban life and will allegedly inform some of the upcoming WandaVision Marvel show on Disney+. But beginning in 2016, King began his most ambitious project, taking over writing Batman following DC's Rebirth reboot event. The book was published twice a month, and King announced he intended to write a 106-issue story. In May of 2019, it was announced the run would be shortened to 85 issues. And that Batman run just wrapped up, so I think it's the ideal time to take a look at what Tom King did right, some of the areas where he fell short, and anything in between. Overall, I do like Tom King comics. I think that they're very well, but I do think that there are some areas where characterization can be inconsistent. So let's take a look at an overview of his entire run on Batman, some of the important arcs, the highs and lows, so that we can analyze and uh, get familiar with the techniques that he commonly uses. I'm not trying to outright summarize or spoil the issues, but I am going to go from beginning to end. What I'll do instead of spoiling big moments is just refer to the overall arc. But this is your spoiler warning in case you want to enter completely free and don't know anything before you read it. King's run begins with a one-shot called Rebirth to coincide with DC's Rebirth event, and appropriately, it deals with Rebirth. Batman and one of his protégés, Duke Thomas, train in one scene that directly references Batman Year One by Frank Miller and David Mazzucchelli. Batman and Duke go up against the villain Calendar Man, who we learn is constantly reborn with the seasons. Duke wonders how they can defeat someone who grows stronger, and Batman replies they will also become stronger. It's a type of commentary on Batman the title constantly being reborn with new creative teams. The first story arc is called I Am Gotham and begins with Batman steering a commuter jet taken over by terrorists. He rides it, calculating that the only way to land it safely will result in him dying, and he makes his peace with this, saying goodbye to Alfred, his butler and father figure. But he's saved at the last moment by new superheroes Gotham and Gotham Girl. Over the course of the arc, Batman agrees to take them under his wing, but Gotham goes crazy and Batman has to call in his Justice League allies to take him down. 
This is an interesting set of ideas. Batman has often taken allies under his wing, uh, anyone from Robin to Huntress to Batwoman, but they're rarely super powered beings. And this changes that up. It also addresses the idea of why doesn't Batman call in the Justice League when he has a really big problem? Uh, it's not something we really see in the Batman titles, but we see it here. And there's a good reason for that because Gotham and Gotham Girl are given abilities where they can um, use up as much power as they want, but it shortens their lifespan when they use it. In a little way, it's kind of like Spawn in that regard. Uh, so they can be more powerful than even Superman, it would just drastically reduce their lifespan. Uh, this story contains a lot of elements. We're being introduced to Batman and Gotham Girl and Gotham. We're being introduced to other villains like Psycho Pirate, a really powerful villain who's been a key figure in events like Crisis on Infinite Earths. He was actually used by the Anti-Monitor, the main villain in that. Because Psycho Pirate can manipulate anyone's emotions. Even up to the gods, he can manipulate somebody's emotions. That's a really powerful ability. It's a lot to introduce in one story arc, and some people have claimed that Tom King tells decompressed stories, uh, built for the trade paperback. I really don't agree with that, because I think this is a lot of story fit into five issues. The second arc is called I Am Suicide, and it involves Batman putting together his own Suicide Squad team to go to his enemy Bane's island. Villain Hugo Strange traded the Psycho Pirate to Bane in exchange for the drug Venom, which he uses to make monsters. Now, Batman wants Psycho Pirate to help cure Gotham Girl from the trauma of losing her brother Gotham. The story features a king trope, his use of repetition as a motif. In Mr. Miracle, that took the form of repeated panels announcing Darkseid is. In this story, Batman continues to repeat the same threat to Bane over and over, that he has come to get Psycho Pirate to save someone that needs to be saved, and if he doesn't surrender him, Batman will break his damn back. The arc sets up Bane as the main villain of King's entire run, and even contrasts Bane and Batman's early lives of growing up orphans. It really hammers home the core theme King is interested in writing about, which is one of his personal tropes, how trauma rewrites how people think. It's been a key element of his runs on Vision, Mr. Miracle, and Batman. This is speculation, but that interest that Tom King has in trauma may be due to personal reasons. He started writing Batman in 2016, and apparently that year he also suffered a panic attack, and while he was in the hospital recovering from that, he learned that his grandmother, who had raised him, uh, passed away. That's a pretty traumatic event. It may have sparked some of his interest in looking into trauma. Uh, trauma is interesting. It rewrites how we think. It's one of the few things that can fundamentally alter our personalities, and this story does feature a Batman who goes through a trauma, and it does change him. The third arc rounds out the I Am trilogy with I Am Bane. Bane comes back to Gotham after Batman, and is built up as a terrifying menace, making his way through many of Batman's rogues gallery to get to him, hiding in Arkham Asylum. There is one element I found implausible. Bruce Wayne eats a cheeseburger with a fork and knife. No, in all seriousness, he gathers his three Robins and Duke and tells them Bane is coming and he wants them to stay out of the way. There's a very cheap cliffhanger that implies Bane killed all of the Robins when they secretly went after Bane on their own. I don't think they do that, and in the next issue, it's explained Bane didn't kill them. So Batman puts them in cryostasis in Superman's Fortress of Solitude. I would like to see more of Batman as a father figure, but King doesn't seem to have much interest in Robin and sidelines them in a way I don't quite buy. However, the story continues to build on Catwoman as both a crime fighting partner and a serious romance. And following this story arc, Batman actually proposes to Catwoman. This is somewhat awkwardly interrupted by a two-issue crossover with The Flash, tying into the then-upcoming event, Doomsday Clock. It interrupts the flow of the overall story, but does give us a fantastic fight scene between Batman and Reverse Flash that Batman just cannot win, and also introduces Batman face-to-face -face with his father, who became Batman in the Flashpoint alternate timeline which is somehow resurrected here. 
Thomas Wayne is more vicious than Bruce Wayne and is more traumatized by losing his son. He knows the pain of being Batman and is willing to do anything to convince his son to stop living that life. By this point, I think it's clear that pacing is very important to Tom King. In Batman, he'll alternate between stories that may be three or four issues and larger ones that can be eight to ten issues. It's really not paced for the trade paperback specifically. Some issues can feature long poetic monologues. Others can be nearly dialogue free. This means a reader can sometimes breeze through an issue and that is frustrating when they're $3.99, but it's also something you can handle uniquely in comics compared to books or movies where you can only read or watch within set timing. Comics can be slowed down or sped up. King takes advantage of pacing within individual issues by carefully deciding on how many issues he'll be using in a story arc and how many panels within a page of an issue to use. Mr. Miracle exemplifies this best where he'll utilize nine panel grids that make the reader read each bit of dialogue and know that's a moment in time before the gutters between panels separate things. He and artist Mitch Gerards also used that to great effect in Mr. Miracle to physically separate the traumatized Mr. Miracle from people that could be right next to him. Yet we read that gutter as a type of separation and isolation. This structure was common in the early days of comic book storytelling, and Dave Gibbons used it to superior effect in Watchmen. So it's only appropriate that in a two-part story where Batman and Flash have a crossover event related to the story Doomsday Clock, which is tied to Watchmen, the storytelling becomes a nine-panel grid once more. So far, we are 24 issues in, and I am all in. There have been some great adventure beats. There have been some great character beats. If you're going to criticize anything, I guess you could argue that Batman is sometimes a bit too competent. Like, there's a scene where he takes out hundreds of Bane's guards. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's something I really like about Bane. He's built up as a calculating and powerful threat! That's my Bane impression, you're welcome. <laughs> I like what they do with Bane a lot. And I also buy into the Batman-Catwoman romance, which is placed forefront. I think that Catwoman is the romantic partner for Batman. She can keep up with him, she challenges him. I've always believed that she's the best fit as a romantic interest. So, so far, I really like it. Before Catwoman can give an answer to Batman's proposal, Batman reveals to Catwoman his greatest shame. A year ago, there was a gang war between Joker and Riddler, and it culminated in Batman attempting to kill Riddler. I actually do believe in Batman losing it in the moment, because Riddler had done something unforgivable. He'd killed the son of Kite Man. Kite Man is a joke villain, but another trope of King's is his passion for minor characters and using them in important ways. This holds true for characters like Kite Man and Ventriloquist in his Batman run. The storyline is eight issues and has interludes detailing the origin and tragedy of D-list villain Kite Man, which is very engrossing. Joker is depressed and can't laugh, and it leads to a very unpredictable and scary Joker. Riddler's interpretation didn't work for me as much because he was more of a weird jock with his shirt frequently off or open, big sideburns, and he carves a question mark into his chest. But this is DC Rebirth, and I'm not against a new interpretation of Riddler. This take just didn't 100% click with me. I would also have liked to see more of the battles between Riddler and Joker, who each recruit all of Batman's other villains. We get some montages and hear the police talk about the death toll, but rarely see the actual skirmishes. Odd that they couldn't fit that into an eight-issue story arc. There are still cool moments, though, like Deathstroke versus Deadshot, and Riddler and Batman arming his faction with Kite Man's kites to get to Joker's skyscraper headquarters. And again, I bought into Batman's interpretation in this story. I loved the framing device of Batman telling Catwoman about his greatest shame. Uh, I thought that that was an important and believable character beat. I really liked the idea of the depressed and unhinged Joker uh, just acting in a very chaotic way, trying to find his laugh. That was, that was legit scary. Riddler didn't work too well for me. 
Uh, initially, we're told that his motivation is that Riddler wants to take out Joker because he figures one of them will be the one to ultimately kill Batman, so first they have to kill each other so that only one of them can have the pleasure of finishing off Batman. But then at the last minute, we're told that his motivation all along was actually to make the Riddler laugh and solve the riddle of the Joker. Why would he care about that? Fortunately, this is followed up with a nearly perfect story of Batman and Superman going on a double date with Catwoman and Lois Lane to an amusement park where they all have to dress up as each other. It's just fun and has gorgeous artwork by Clay Mann. After that, there's a team up with Wonder Woman where they agree to fight for a superhero that lives in a dimension where time moves much faster and Batman and Wonder Woman battle supernatural forces there for 37 years. It's a little over the top, but it does have some nice character moments and some really fantastic art by Joel Jones. After a few more short stories, it's almost time for the wedding, and the Joker is jealous that he wasn't invited. He ends up holding another wedding party hostage. During this event, Joker holds the bride at gunpoint with Batman right in front of him, and Batman fails to save the hostage. I have an issue with this. I am not against the idea of Batman failing from time to time. I think that a flawed character that makes mistakes is inherently interesting. Uh, they've got something to overcome. Uh, but we've also been presented with a Batman who can do amazing things. He can ride a jet, he can take out hundreds of armed guards, and yet he somehow can't save just one hostage that's right in front of him. I'm not against that happening so much as exactly how this was presented. It, 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 felt, it felt a little implausible how this was specifically laid out to me. Uh, it's a little depressing. That may be kind of the point. Uh, again, I'm not against the idea of a superhero failing, but I do think that there is a difference between heroes failing and superheroes being presented as incapable. It's a fine line. Your mileage may vary. The more important element of this story is Joker confronting Catwoman and telling her that if she marries Batman, he'll be happy and then he won't be Batman. This seed of doubt is planted and bears fruit when Catwoman's friend Holly later voices similar concerns. It all culminates with Catwoman leaving Batman at the altar. The wedding falling apart proved to be controversial. Uh, it worked for me. Uh, even if the logic doesn't hold up, I believe that Catwoman could have believed that and that that caused things to fall apart. It doesn't mean that they don't love each other and that they can't get back together. It means that in this moment, the wedding, which had been built up to for about, you know, 24 issues at this point, fell apart. Uh, and the thing that's worth noting is in the moment, that may not have worked, but I think when you look at the full arc and you realize that takes place basically halfway through, that there's a lot more story still to come. There, there's something still to tell. And this was a turning point for Batman the character. This dealt him a huge traumatic blow. And we we're later told that basically this was all the result of Bane's manipulations. He made Holly voice those doubts so that Catwoman had those doubts. I think it makes a type of sense. But again, your mileage may vary. The next three-issue arc is arguably the best in Tom King's run. It's called Cold Days, and it involves Batman stopping Mr. Freeze, who goes on trial with the death penalty on the table. But Batman realizes he made a mistake and beat a possibly false confession out of Mr. Freeze. This is the beginning of a Batman going just a bit over the edge after his breakup. But he uses his money to get on the jury as Bruce Wayne and spends the arc working to convince the jury that Batman was wrong. It's a fantastic story featuring the two sides of Batman working to correct a mistake. It also features some great artwork by Lee Weeks, an underrated and rock solid artist. This story works on so many levels. It's a great mystery because we're not sure who killed these women. If it wasn't Mr. Freeze, who was it? Uh, it works as a courtroom drama. You don't get that in comics too often. It works like some sort of superhero version of 12 Angry Men. And it works as a character piece with Batman and Bruce Wayne on opposite sides. You don't get to see a lot of stories with just Bruce Wayne, but this is all about Bruce Wayne and him using himself to argue against Batman, to try to correct a mistake. I loved it. It worked for me.
Directly following this arc is another three-issue arc of Batman and Nightwing patrolling. Nightwing was Batman's first Robin and adopted son. I'm not a massive fan of the dialogue in these issues, as Nightwing quips a lot, and Batman just says no a lot. It culminates in Nightwing being shot in the head by a sniper, revealed to be the KG Beast, who Batman relentlessly pursues over the next few issues. All of the events we've seen so far do add up, but at this point in time, it was hard to see that. It works better in retrospect, but taking out Nightwing is a bit of a strange move. By that I mean Nightwing has his own comics, and he's a member of the Teen Titans. It's unlikely DC would suddenly kill him off, and in fact, he survives with a very soap opera-esque case of amnesia, adopting the tough guy persona of Rick Grayson. But none of that is addressed within the pages of Batman itself. But if you don't read other Batman-related titles outside of Batman, you'll never really know what happens to Nightwing. That lack of closure is a bit frustrating. Another example of a frustration of not knowing what's happening to Batman-related characters outside of this title is the status of the Tim Drake Robin. In an early story arc, Bruce Wayne mentions that Tim Drake is dead. However, by the final arc in the storyline, City of Bane, Tim Drake is alive and kicking. It's frustrating that the Batman title does not bring you up to speed with supporting characters who exist outside of the Batman title. King's decision led to sudden changes outside of his own title. Uh, for instance, Tim Seeley was the writer on Nightwing, and that changed his creative direction. He ended up having creative differences with DC and left the title over this. So. I don't know if it was really the right decision for Tom King to do this to Nightwing specifically. Uh, Nightwing is used in other titles. Maybe it would have made more sense to use a character that was just somebody that appears in Batman. So maybe not Batwoman, maybe not Nightwing, but what about one of the Robins or Duke Thomas? Somebody like that. It may have made more sense to use one of them at the time. That's just my personal thoughts though. It's an element that didn't quite work for me. The following arc is great though. We finally learn that Bane has been orchestrating all the pain and suffering in Batman's life. He's running things from Arkham, where he pretends to be a prisoner in pain. Batman isn't falling for it, but it isolates him from Commissioner Gordon and the Bat family, who do believe Bane is simply an inmate. Bane had Holly convince Catwoman she would ruin Batman's life by making him happy. Bane had Nightwing taken out. He's isolated Batman from his allies and gained the help of Gotham Girl through his use of Psycho Pirate. He's also gained the aid of Thomas Wayne's Batman, who has mysteriously survived and is aiding Bane for his own personal reasons. Penguin actually turns on Bane, acting as a secret informant for Batman. Why? It relates to trauma once again. Penguin lost the love of his life and doesn't really care what happens to him now, so he wants Bane taken out for the disrespect he shows for Penguin and how he kept him away from his love in her final moments. It finally gives Batman insight into Bane's overall manipulations, but when Batman angrily goes after Bane, he's taken out by his own father. Thomas then takes Bruce out to a Lazarus pit in the desert with a plan to resurrect his wife and Batman's mother. The two have a knockdown, drag out fight, and one Batman emerges from the fight, but we don't yet know which one. What could be more painful, more traumatic for a son than being rejected, physically rejected, by your own father? Uh, this pain and trauma is half of what Tom King's run is about, and I'll get back to the other half in a few more moments. The next arc is called Nightmares. I don't care much for it, as it plays like a series of vignettes about Batman's fears. At the end, we see that Batman was hooked up to some sort of machine, and he was experiencing hallucinations for seven issues. It builds on some themes, but is ultimately somewhat inconsequential to moving the story forward. I did like the next short arc, The Fall and The Fallen. Batman fights his way out of Arkham in a reverse of Bane invading, back in I Am Bane. Batman is then rescued by Catwoman. They reconnect, having never fallen out of love. They begin training together. Bane has taken the time that Batman was immobilized to take over Gotham City. Batman's rogues are put in place as the police. 
Batman's allies, are stymied because Bane has taken Alfred and later Damien hostage. Respectively, these are Batman's father figure and literal son. On top of that, the government is blocked from invading because Bane has Gotham Girl. This leads into the 10-part finale, City of Bane. Batman heads back to Gotham and is able to take down Bane because he cheats and lets Catwoman aid him. It's just smart to trick Bane like this. But even then, Bane is about to overpower both of them when he's stopped by Thomas Wayne, who incapacitates both of them. Thomas is willing to consider killing his own son to stop Bruce from being Batman in the final pair of issues. As to where it ends, well, I don't want to spoil that specific moment for you. I've tried to avoid uh, certain big moments that take place. I've given you the broad strokes of each arc, but I haven't talked to you about specific moments. So if you have read it, you already know. If you haven't, now you have an idea of what Tom King writes about. So what does King do well? Well, he carefully structures arcs to highlight characters in new ways. He elevates the romance and trauma aspects of Bruce Wayne's life. He has some great action scenes and makes Bane and Thomas Wayne terrifying threats. He doesn't add a lot of new characters outside of Gotham Girl. Overall, I like that his entire run was about how trauma started Batman on his path, but love is ultimately what saves his life and keeps him from going over the edge. I do think some of this could have used his adopted sons in more meaningful ways, but he chose to focus on Catwoman, and them as a pair does work very well. King also writes for his artists. David Finch gets to do gritty action. Clay Mann gets to draw beautiful people in engaging discussions. John Romita Jr. gets a rainy Gotham night. Most of these stories play to the artist's strengths. What didn't I like? Some of the character moments didn't ring true to me. His take on Riddler, for instance, but that becomes personal preference, and I did like his take on a depressed Joker and a sad sack kite man. Some people won't care for the dialogue. It can be repetitious. It can remind you of Brian Michael Bendis and how he has people talk in elliptical and supposedly real ways, but that can ring hollow for some. It works for me. I don't mind long monologues and poetry. I think that's some of what's unique to comics compared to movies or TV. Your mileage may vary. There's one more ridiculous thing about this Batman run that I want to talk about, but it isn't really a complaint, uh, so I'm going to talk about that right after the fan art section. Uh, let's just uh, take a look at the whole thing and uh, quickly address the question, why was this run shortened from 100 or so issues down to 85? Uh, it wasn't sales. Uh, sales were uniformly strong. No, instead what happened was DC said that they needed to utilize Batman in a big event, and Tom King said, you know what? that would sort of interrupt the story I want to tell. I'll just shorten my story a little. And he's going to tell a side project. He's got a maxi series, Batman, Catwoman, that will wrap up his thoughts on them as a couple. And I think that makes sense. Um, when you look at it though, uh, this was a long run and it's up there with writers like uh, Morrison, Snyder, Mensch, they've all had long runs. Uh, Denny O'Neill, it's way up there. 85 issues is a lot, and I think he accomplished a lot. I think he took Batman in some interesting new di directions. Um, was it perfect? No, it wasn't perfect. Uh, there were some arcs that were sour notes for me, but I do personally think that it wrapped up on a solid note. I liked City of Bane. I liked where it ended. Uh, it's sad and tragic and romantic, and I just liked it. Uh, there's a lot to like about it. If you liked this run, I would recommend looking at Mr. Miracle and uh, Sheriff of Baghdad. Those are two more great uh, projects. Actually, also Vision. Vision is also a fantastic Tom King book. So he has some really solid stuff out there that I would recommend if you like this. Um, hopefully, you appreciate this look at the entire run. It's a lot to look at. It's not, it's not something I can uniformly praise. I liked it, but I can't love it because there were some, some low points for me. Um, Anyway, it took me a lot of time to think of how I wanted to structure my argument there. That was a lot to take in. Let's quickly take a look at fan art, and then I have one more thing to comment on. Vial Pando sent in a great piece referencing my recent trip to Japan. Check out more of Vial's work on Instagram. Vance Capley illustrated this beautiful piece based off of the episode about Brubaker and Phillips' crime comics. Vance has a website with more of his artwork. 
This cool artwork is of me being ashamed of the Ninja Turtles from their Christmas special, and it was created by Joseph Bleak. Love it. Someone from the YouTube channel Amit Productions illustrated me drinking beer and reading about comic book creators. Accurate. Finally, longtime viewer Justin Muse kindly sent in this cool logo for comic tropes. Much appreciated, Justin. So I did just get back from Japan and I got a bunch of new gachapon. I haven't had time to put it in the gachapon machine yet. I will by next week. Um, but let's take a look at who won a prize. I've got uh, five balls in the ball hopper. If you would like to have artwork featured on this channel, just go ahead and send it to comictropes at gmail.com. I'm happy to include it. And uh, then I will enter somebody in a chance to win a gachapon prize. And uh, so let's see who wins it. That gachapon prize normally comes out of the gachapon machine donated by Lunar Shine Store. Um, sorry, I can barely... Uh, show this on screen let's see i'm reaching in here we've got number number two that would be this artwork so i'm just showing who number two is and uh you want a gachapon prize like i said i didn't put it in the gachapon machine yet but i'm gonna reach into a bag and pull it out all right and uh by the way i've started a second channel where i'll have things that aren't quite comic book related for instance uh videos like my trip to Japan. Um, I'll have a video detailing what I got for gachapons. I'll have a video uh, where I do, oh, any live streams, for instance. Any live streams in the future, I'll do on that channel. It's called uh, Pros and Cons. So check that out. And um, I'll just reach in here in this bag. All right, this prize looks like, looks like it's an Ultraman figure. Ultraman is, uh, Big popular character, I can't get it to focus. But there's a character in here that you build together, uh, Ultraman. This is a pretty pretty nice gachapon. I'll send that your way. Um, is there anything else I need to say? Just, uh, you have my thanks for being patient. This episode took longer than a typical episode. And I've come to realize uh, that sometimes that's gonna be the case moving forward. I have always worked really hard on this channel for years to have it come out weekly. I've ignored illness, I've ignored uh, technical problems. I've ignored work schedules and all sorts of other things and said, no, I'm going to keep to a weekly schedule. Uh, but, you know, I just couldn't do it within a week and feel that it was a good episode. It took me longer to write and rewrite my thoughts on this. Uh, and that brings me to my final thought that I said I would talk about, which was uh, just a, a weird element in the uh, in the early issues of Batman. I believe it was at the beginning of I Am Suicide. Anyway, uh, Batman investigates the wreckage of that jet that the terrorists took over, and he adds up their dog tag numbers, and the number he gets is whatever, like, number X is out of the alphabet. What would that be? Like, something like 25 or something? X, Y, Z. Yeah, 25, I guess it must have been. And from there, he goes, ah, X. That has something to do with Task Force X, a.k.a. the Suicide Squad. Uh, I better go talk to Amanda Waller. I was like, what is this jump in logic? Uh, so that felt like something out of the 1960s Batman show. Uh, I do love, when I read Batman comics, I love mysteries and crime stuff. You guys know that from some of my previous episodes. So I like it when Batman is a detective. He's not much of a detective in this. I mean, he does solve things, but we don't like really, most of it isn't presented as a mystery. The only mystery that's really presented is in cold days. Who actually killed those people if it wasn't Mr. Freeze? Uh, we actually learned that right at the beginning of the following arc. I won't spoil it for you. So that is a de decent mystery. There are some mysteries. I just like a little bit more of that personally. And I thought that that moment was ridiculous. I was like, wait, I don't understand this logic. You can add up the numbers of terrorists' dog tags, and that leads you to Amanda Wall. No, no, that didn't work. But anyway, I did have fun reading these 85 issues. Uh, next week, I will be back with another big DC project that just wrapped up. Maybe you can guess what I'm talking about, but I should be back within a week. Um, sometimes it may take me two weeks moving forward in order to keep the quality where I want it to be. I hope you can understand that. Thank you so much for sticking with me, and until I see you next time, Keep reading comics.